Good evening and welcome to the Getty on this beautiful autumnal evening. Um, I'm the director of the Getty Conservation Institute and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. The Conservation Institute, or the GCI as we call it, works around the world to improve and advance the practice of conservation. And we do that with professionals from many, many different places. We work to advance conservation on works of art, uh, buildings, as you'll hear about tonight, archaeology and sites and places. And we have really the most privileged uh, circumstance and opportunities of uh, any part of the Getty. And I say that in front of my president here this evening, Jim. <laughs> we love what we do. But tonight you'll get to hear about work we're doing in the realm of conserving modern architecture, which is something we're taking very seriously here at the Getty. And it's probably worth uh, understanding this work in the greater context of the Getty. Obviously, the Getty's deeply invested in modern architecture because you're sitting in this remarkable Richard Meyer complex. So that's uh, step one. But indeed, I, I must mention the extraordinarily rich collections that reside within the Getty Research Institute here, collections of architects' papers, architects' drawings and models, that are uh, re really represent and document the 20th century, like very few collections, and it's, it's a, a great emphasis of my colleagues there. And indeed, my colleagues at the Getty Foundation are invested in a program and an initiative called Keeping It Modern, where they're providing funds to projects around the world, both for research and planning, but also the implementation of conservation projects at uh, iconic uh, buildings around the world. And so all of us are working together to advance an agenda that really focuses resources on research, best practice, uh, on what is a remarkable legacy out of the 20th century. So it's a really exciting time for built heritage here uh, around um, the middle part of the last century. So it's a particular pleasure for all of us here at the Getty Conservation Institute uh, to have this opportunity to present work we're doing together with our colleagues from the Salk Institute in La Jolla and our colleagues uh, at Architects with Jenny Elsner uh, on the conservation of the building. Uh, through our work here at the Conservation Institute, and you'll be hearing about that tonight, and support from the Getty Foundation, uh, which is supporting a conservation master plan for the Salk uh, Institute. Um, I think all of us together with colleagues from the Salk and colleagues from Wisjani uh, are, are really building, uh, I think, a, a, a wonderful opportunity to preserve what is this remarkable Lou Khan building in La Jolla. Um, I'd love uh, to just uh, welcome all of our colleagues from La Jolla, from the Salk Institute, who have driven down today and this afternoon to be here. Um, it's easier to get from London often from, than from San Diego. So we're really thrilled you're here. And um, uh, I, I, I constantly say that our work uh, at the Conservation Institute uh, only succeeds because we have remarkable partners and we've had remarkable partners from the Salk. And so we'd like to thank you all for everything you allow us to do with you. And also, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Jonathan Salk, who is with us this evening tonight with his wife, Elizabeth Shepard. Jonathan is the son of Jonah Salk and uh, speaks so eloqu eloquently about how and why the Salk exists as it does and why the commission was uh, uh, created in the way it was. And so it's just a pleasure to have you both with us tonight. And thank you for coming from Westwood to be with us here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to welcome my colleague, uh, Susan McDonald, to the podium. Uh, Susan is the head of our Buildings and Sites Division at the Getty Conservation Institute, but she also uh, leads our Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative at the GCI. And it is she who uh, has been guiding this work in La Jolla, and indeed uh, our work at uh, other iconic places, including Crosstown at the Eames House uh, nearby. So Susan, um, thank you and welcome to the podium. Thanks, Tim. 
So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening um, to one of our regular Conserving Modern Architecture events. Um, as Tim said, uh, the purpose of this, this Conserving Modern Architecture initiative is to advance the practice of conserving modern architecture, and we've, we're doing this through a program of uh, the creation and dissemination of information through a um, program of research, uh, through training and education, and also through model field projects. And our work in the field, be it at the Silk Road sites of Magal, which were recently uh, formed part of the exhibition that was here at the Getty, um, the Roman site of Herculaneum, or uh, the churches that we're working on Peru all have similar obje objectives. And that is um, that through the specific sites, we can tackle conservation challenges that are of international relevance um, through our programs of rigorous research, through diagnostic investiga investigative um, work, our capacity building and then dissemination. And our work in the realm of modern architecture is doing exactly the same thing with our field projects there. Uh, so we are really delighted tonight to present to you the work that we've been uh, doing at the Salk Biological Institute. As Tim said, it's a second of our field projects associated with the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative. The first one, as Tim said, is the Eames House, and some of you were here last year when we presented that work. And just to remind you, if you missed that lecture, you can uh, see it on our website. Um, but tonight we're talking about our work at the Salk uh, Biological Institute, which is a work, of course, of international acclaim, an incredible piece of modern architecture, which is the representative of the collective genius of two important figures from the 20th century, scientist Jonas Salk and architect Louis Kahn. Uh, I, think, um, I think, and I think many would agree, that arguably this is Kahn's greatest work. Uh, its response to the site, uh, its connection between use and a pla as a place of great scientific thought expressed through its architecture uh, and its monumentality as an extraordinary um, expression is, is, makes it really remarkable. Um, it is a site uh, of architectural pilgrimage and therefore what happens to this building is one of great interest and of course uh, great sensitivity. So it has been a, a, a great privilege for, for, for those of us that have been um, fortunate enough to partner with the SALK here to develop the appropriate conservation approaches and strategies for its ongoing conservation and stewardship. And I can share with you that when we first started exploring the possibility as whether we could bring something to this endeavour, it was really quite emotional because for a generation of architects um, amongst those that work with us at the, the Getty that have grown up in absolute awe of this building, the idea that we might be able to contribute to its conservation moved many uh, of us to, to tears, and, and that's true. Um, such is its power and its great nobility. Um, as of our work at the Eames House, this project really aimed to demonstrate the applicability of the normal conservation approaches to a modern building, something that isn't necessarily uh, well recognised by owners of modern buildings or something that they're not always willing to resource. So the need to fully understand the building's importance and go through a rigorous pro process of investigation and diagnosis, historical and scientific research to understand the physical problems and really understand what the causes are and then to develop approaches to solving these problems, to test them and trial them in the field and then rethink and, and go back and, and work out the way forward. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is develop long-term conservation strategies that are sustainable and meet the needs of, of course, the owner. And these are all necessary processes that are part of the conservation process. Uh, but of course, you know, dealing with user needs and the physical problems is just one part of it. We also have to balance the conservation challenges that arise as part of this process. And it does require a different approach from the normal uh, approach to a building repair or asset management that such an institutional building might normally uh, experience. So through the lens of the Teague Window Wall Project, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, um, and that's what triggered our involvement, um, ultimately what we're aiming to do is to, to really try and embed conservation approaches into the day-to-day -day care of the building and its long-term conservation and the asset management um, of the site. So the Teague Window Wall Project, which, as I said, what brings us here, is the largest physical intervention um, at the building since it was constructed in 1965. And it really represents a critical moment in the building's lifespan. 
Modern buildings tend to come up for their first major repair around the 50-year mark, and these projects have the potential to irreparably damage a place or to actually set it on a path for ongoing careful stewardship and conservation based on sound knowledge, understanding and sound conservation. Uh, fortunately, this building has had um, very careful and thoughtful stewardship through its life. Um, the owner has always recognised the criticalness of the relationship between the building's use and its architecture, and that's been embedded in the ethos of the institution. And this, of course, has sustained that spirit of collaboration between Jonas Salk and Louis Kahn that is so fundamental to the, its success uh, as a scientific research institute and a work of great modern architecture. Um, as you'll see when the, the presenters uh, start to talk about the work, this is a project that is midstream. It's not actually finished. And, and usually we might wait until the end of a project to talk about it. But um, because um, I think that uh, this building is so important and people are so interested in what's happening there, we thought it was important to present the work at this stage. Um, I think it also uh, represent, or it sort of demonstrates the fact that despite the Salk Biological Institute, whose, whose mission is first and foremost to undertake world, you know, very important scientific research, um, they also recognise that what happens to this building is very important and people's interest in it uh, is, it's important to share people share what's happening with people because of that particular interest. Um, as Tim said, um, the Salk Institute did receive a grant from the Keeping It Modern program from our foundation to undertake a conservation management plan, and this has been undertaken in parallel with, uh, with our work. And that document will provide a long-term framework for the care of the building, and, and, and I think Kyle and Tim will both talk about that. Um, but let's um, get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce our three speakers tonight. Uh, We'll have three speakers, each one will present a different aspect of the work and then we'll gather for a, uh, a short uh, panel discussion and then we'll open the floor for questions. So if you have questions, uh, hang on to them and we'll, we'll get to them uh, towards the end of the program. So Sarah Ladenmark, project architect, um, and project specialist, sorry, an architect from the GCI, managed the project uh, here at the GCI. And she's going to talk about the work that we undertook to do the research work, the technical work, to understand some of the challenges and the problems and to help develop some of the repair approaches and techniques. Um, Sarah will be followed by Carl Normanden from the practice of Wisjani Elsner. Uh, he's an associate principal there and is the project architect for Wisjani's work on, on the building. And he's going to talk about the trial work and then the construction project that has subsequently been developed and is underway now. And then our colleague Tim Ball, who's the Senior Director of Facilities Services at the Salk Biological Institute and who's responsible for the management of this project and also responsible for the, for the building on a day-to-day -day basis, will talk about this work and and um, the conservation management plan and some other aspects of the work uh, from the owner's perspective. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Susan, for that introduction and to my co-presenters, Kyle and Tim, for collaborating with me on tonight's presentation. I'm so pleased that all of you have joined us tonight for this discussion of a building that I, like many of you in this room, first fell in love with as a young architecture student. And I will confess that I was one of those staff members who may have shed a tear or two <laughs> when we found out we were gonna work on this building. So thank you to the Salk Institute for letting us work with you on your building. I am going to um, just start out by giving you um, some historical background um, about the overall context of the site before delving into the teak window wall project itself. And Susan has already introduced the major collaborators. Um, on this project, Dr. Jonas Salk and Lou Kahn. Um, so Dr. Salk is best known for developing the first successful polio vaccine in the late 1940s and 50s, when the infectious viral disease was at the height of its devastation in the United States and abroad. In 1957, he began to establish what would ultimately become the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. His goal was to create a collaborative environment where researchers could explore the basic principles of life and contemplate the wider implications of their discoveries for the future of humanity. And for the building that, he would, that would house his future institute, Salk wanted a facility that would both support scientific research and foster the exchange of ideas between scientists and cultural leaders. Or, as he's often, often quoted as saying, that the test of the architecture was that it should be a place where he could entertain Pablo Picasso. 
Salk first became aware of architect Louis Kahn through his work on another laboratory, the Richards Medical Research Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. And in Kahn, Salk found a like philosophical mind similar to his own. The two men developed a friendship and began to regard one another as a collaborator on the project, with Kahn calling him his most tr trusted critic. So the Institute is located on a 27 acre site overlooking the Pacific Ocean in La Jolla. I've circled um, the site of the laboratory building under construction in the early 1960s. So it sits on this U-shaped Torrey Pines Mesa with a rugged canyon separating it from the ocean to the west. As some of you know, um, the original concept for the site was a tripartite design that included a meeting place, a living place, and a laboratory. What was actually built is only a fragment of that concept but a remarkable fragment indeed, the laboratory building. And for those of you who know the history of the site and have a keen eye, if you look at the center of the um, courtyard in this model, you'll see that it shows trees and plants in the courtyards, in the courtyard, which is what Kahn's um, earlier ideas for the plaza was until he famously consulted with Mexican architect uh, Louis Barragan who advised that he'd pave it and create a plaza and a facade to the sky. The so that laboratory that was built consists of two nearly identical wings of laboratory space, freestanding study towers, which are separated from the labs by a series of courtyards, and office space at the west end of the complex, each of these wings mirroring the other on either side of that paved central plaza. A key design feature is the physical separation of the private study spaces, which Kahn referred to as the architecture of the oak table and the rug, from the collective workspace of the laboratories with their architecture of air cleanliness and area adjustability. The fenestration is an exterior expression of these different spaces. Large expanses of steel and glass curtain walls are used in the collective workspace of these laboratories versus the individual wood windows that are used in the offices and studies. The focus on the individual in these areas is further expressed by the functionality of the various sliding components that allow the occupants to modulate light and ventilation within their workspaces. So the Salk Institute has been formally designated as a local landmark. However, it is widely considered a masterpiece of modern architecture of national and international significance. The statement of significance in the fourth coming uh, conservation management plan that Wyss Janney and Inskip and Jenkins Architects of London um, is preparing, found it to be an outstanding building by one of the most important architects of the late 20th century, an outstanding example of an innov innovatory research laboratory, an outstanding example of landscape design, and that the site's significance is further enhanced through its association with Jonas Salk and other leading scientists. So what are these window walls that we're talking about? They're prefabricated assemblies, which consist of exterior teak cladding, uh, which is shown in the left image, um, an internal core of softwood framing and asbestos cement panel sheathing, and an, in an interior paneling of oak. Um, an internal pocket houses these sliding sashes, which include windows, louvers, and shutters. Teak was specifically chosen by Kahn because he thought it to be a durable, maintenance-free material requiring no surface treatments, <laughs> and that in its anticipated gray or white weathered state, it would be compatible with the adjacent concrete. So how um, were these, uh, and they were prefabricated, so how that was actually done is that the internal wood core, which is shown here, a wood framing um, in this exploded axonometric view, was assembled in a local cabinet maker shop. Then the sheathing board was put in place and then the teak cladding and frame members. And then this was delivered as an element to the site, craned into place, bolted at the top and the bottom to the concrete uh, floor and ceiling above. And then the internal sheathing and uh, paneling was put in place. And there's some very narrow glass side lights on either side which uh, serve as shim space and also allow light to kind of to uh, graze the side of the walls. 
So after 50 years in a marine environment, these window walls have weathered to a non-uniform appearance and are deteriorated. In some areas, the teak has a weathered gray appearance, which is compatible with this idea that Kahn had for the teak weathering to match the color of the concrete. In other areas, the remains of later wood oil sealers and other finishes that applied in an attempt to protect the teak and improve its appearance, um, they, these remain. And some at the Institute preferred a more pristine look than Kahn did. These treatments give the teak a deep red color, which changes the relationship of the windows to the concrete walls. The growth of a black fungal biofilm on the surface of the wood has given the teak a, a, this black appearance that varies significantly by exposure. This has troubled the Institute from the very early years when it was described as giving the building the effect of a five o'clock shadow. And the project architect was summoned to the site several years after completion to look at the problem. Many cleaning campaigns have been undertaken in an attempt to remove it. However, none have produced long lasting effects. And finally, moisture infiltration and leaks have also been an ongoing problem almost since the completion of construction. So while repairs have been carried out to the building over the years, more serious repairs were needed as the Institute approached the 50 year milestone, that typical age when many modern buildings are in need of a major conservation intervention. Salk initially assumed that the window walls would need to be replaced entirely, but they recognized that such a project could jeopardize the site's significance. In 2013, the collaborative Salk GCI conservation project was developed to see if there were alternative approaches that could better protect the site's significance. So our project scope was to develop a methodology um, that could be used on the teak window walls, but could also be applied to other elements of the site in the future. Um, our methodology uses a standard conservation methodology that has been in use for quite a long time in a variety of heritage sites from archeological sites to 18th and 19th century buildings, as well as modern heritage sites. And it begins with understanding the place, what is significant about it, and then gathering information about its physical condition, external requirements such as codes, client requirements, and feasible uses and then developing principles or guidelines to retain the significance in future use or development. And these principles can, can guide a design response and implementation. It looks like an iterative, it looks like a linear process here, but it's actually an iterative process. So um, this initial SALT GCI collaborative project was divided into two phases. In the first phase, we were going to carry out historic research and significance assessment, condition survey, scientific research and diagnoses, and develop a first pass at conservation policies and preliminary treatment recommendations. And then in the second phase, um, we would carry out a series of on-trial, um, on-site trial mock-ups um, to test some of these ideas um, monitor and evaluate the performance, and then refine the treatment recommendations um, to be further developed in the full design phase. And in the third phase, um, which our colleagues at WIS Jenny have um, guided, it's the development of a uh, full um, design based on the recommendations from the earlier phases of work and the preparation of construction documents and specifications. And finally, as Susan mentioned, um, construction is now underway with first in place mock-ups um, being carried out this summer and now moving forward with the full repair project for all windows. I think our, colle our, our, our colleagues carrying out scientific research at the Salk Institute probably see many similarities in this research process with what they do um, in terms of trials and going back and reevaluating where you're at. And you know th these trials are a very important part of any conservation process and it's quite important to factor in budget and time um, for them to be undertaken. And I just also wanted to point out as a, a side um, note that um, while the scaffolding is in place uh, for the window wall project, um, the Salk and Wisjani have also um, undertaken a project um, to trial repairs to develop a repair strategy for the conservation of the concrete. And Tim Ball will talk about that a bit later this evening. I'm now going to talk about um, the results of that first research and investigative phase. Um, after undertaking the historic research, which involved visits to archives, oral histories, looking at historic photos um, and drawings, 
um, we developed a significance assessment for the window walls themselves within the greater um, institute. And what we, what we found to be significant about the windows are is that they are a prefabricated, um, these prefabricated elements demonstrate a unique synthesis of industry and craft through the customization of the units to fit the many different openings in the concrete and the detailing of the teak wood by the carpenters. And they also demonstrate Dr. Salk's vision of the Institute as a place of humanized science and cons design approach, expressing the human element and scale within the larger monumental structure. The, the materials used in the window walls are part of this limited palette of materials used throughout the site, which includes travertine and water, poured concrete with lead plugs, the teak, the steel and glass, and the stainless steel handrails. And that all of these materials demonstrates Kahn's architectural philosophy to use and honor the unique properties of the selected materials. And finally, the window walls at Salk are an example of custom millwork in Kahn's larger body of work, which can be seen um, at the library at Phillips Exeter Academy, which also has teak uh, window walls set within brick walls, um, and in many of the residential projects um, outside of Philadelphia, such as the Fisher and Corman houses shown here. So then we assessed the various elements of these window wall assemblies um, to look at you know, what was ex exceptionally important versus what was highly, moderately, or little import of little importance, or perhaps even intrusive to the site's significance. And that would help us start to make decisions about where we might intervene if we need to and prioritize and understand what was the most important to preserve in terms of significance and where there was room to perhaps make some modifications. Um, for example, the overall nature of the assembly, that prefabricated assembly, and the teak cladding in the window sashes were determined to be of exceptional significance, while interior stock components, such as the stud framing, which plays a purely functional role, was found to be of moderate significance and could perhaps be replaced with compatible re um, replacement materials when in need of repair. And that past surface coatings were in fact found to be intrusive because of the patchy weathering and the color of them detract from the aesthetic significance of the site. So to better understand the types, and condition, the types of conditions on the site as well as the weathering and deterioration patterns, we first carried out a visual condition survey of the window walls. This was preliminary in nature, um, but it helped us establish the range of conditions. Um, we also worked with our science colleagues at the GCI to carry out um, wood identification and other analyses. I'm, you know, we all assumed it was teak, but one of the issues is that there are a number of tropical hardwoods that are tr commonly referred to as teak, and we wanted to be sure that we did indeed have teak or Tectona grandis on the site. So we worked also with a wood expert um, consultant, Ron Anthony, to carry out macroscopic and microscopic investigations to confirm the species and to assess other characteristics such as growth rings and orientation, all of which were critical to determining appropriate treatments and in sourcing any replacement materials that may be necessary. You know, the analysis showed that the weathering of the wood varied significantly depending on exposure. At some exposures, um, less than 80% of the original thickness remained, and formerly tongue and groove boards now appear to be shiplap boards, as shown in the lower right-hand corner. It was largely the result of natural processes, um, but of course, cleaning practices over the years may have accelerated this in some cases. Um, in other cases, we found that actually the architectural detailing contributed to the deterioration of the wood. For example, we have these horizontal drip rails um, that go across the teak boards. And the original design drawings show that it was originally designed with a three-quarter inch protection, projection and a drip underneath, which would have present, better protected the boards below and provided some durability for weathering. But at some point after visiting the pilot mock-up um, in late 1964, Kahn's office issued a design sketch shown on the right um, where that projection was cut back by two-thirds to something closer to a quarter of an inch, which has not weathered very well over time. And in some cases, this is completely weathered away, allowing water and air to infiltrate the wall cavity. We also looked at the nature of the fungal biofilm. Uh, DNA analysis showed 
um, that that fungus is composed of several types of fungi, most likely coming from the surrounding eucalyptus trees. So it's not a decay fungus and presents more of an aesthetic issue. The heaviest growths are where there is a water source, often at the base of the TNG board, tongue groove boards, where moisture wicks up and the end grains sit directly on the sills and drips. In other cases, such as north-facing exposures, it covers in the, um, nearly the entire wall. Um, understanding what it is and how it thrives helped to develop a solution for retarding its growth. As it is part of the environment in La Jolla, it's not possible to prevent its growth, but we may be able to retard it through the use of fungicides or limiting its access to moisture. Other scientific analyses were undertaken to identify the nature of past surface treatments. Um, we also um, opened up certain sections of the wall to better understand the wall cavity, how they were assembled, and their condition. Uh, part of what we found when we opened the wall cavity was that the flashings at the base and top of the wall, circled in orange on the right, that appear both in the design drawings and the shop drawings were not actually installed. Um, we think it was probably because it was actually difficult to put these fat flashings in place with the way the prefabricated assemblies were actually built and lifted into place. Um, but as a result, we're left with only sealants um, closing these gaps. And because the, the sealants used had a hard time adhering to both the concrete and the teak, we had failure and another path of water into the walls. And then that water, um, of course, along with a warm environment in some cavities, um, and the use of untreated softwoods such as white fir that is not naturally resistant to termites um, created an environment where uh, termites thrived. Uh, and this is, this is an extreme case of where we have a lot of damage to wood framing. In other cases, there's no observable termite damage, but it's variable throughout the institute. So the end result of this work was a diagnosis of weathering and deterioration mechanisms, which is well detailed in a forthcoming project report. And while what I, may have what I described previously may sound dire, there was actually a lot of good news in this. <laughs> um, and one of the most significant findings was that there was a lot of existing wood that was in good condition and could be conserved in place, which was both a better heritage conservation solution and an environmental conservation solution when dealing with an endangered material like naturally grown teak. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about the conservation principles very quickly. And um, so we use that information to develop a series of principles to guide um, the development of a variety of treatments to address these issues. And I'll just quickly go through these to give you an idea of um, what they cover. So the main principles include um, to preserve and respect the significance of the window wall assemblies, to preserve the overall integrity of the wall assembly, for the windows to fulfill their primary purpose as a functional wall and a barrier to the elements. It's, this is not a museum, it's a functioning institute and the windows need to work and do their job at keeping the elements out. Um, to discourage changes to the window wall assemblies that would diminish both cultural, that would diminish cultural significance and to respect and preserve the complementary relationship between that limited palette of materials by not allowing one material in the building to jump forward of the other so to not have bright red window walls that jump out of the concrete. The remaining ones are to preserve the expression of the human scale and the individual demonstrated in the window wall assembly through its detailing and the functionality of the window sashes, which allow the occupants to modulate light and ventilation. To respect, preserve, and retain the natural and unfinished characteristics of the exterior wood to the extent feasible. Um, to allow for subtle to moderate variations in the appearance of the exterior wood as a result of the differential weathering processes across the site, which results in the subtle patina of age. High or extreme variations, such as those of the fungal biofilm, are to be reduced or avoided if possible, which we know is not entirely possible. Um, and then to address any issues related to high or extreme variations in appearance, firstly through design modifications, that are sensitive to the significance of the window wall assemblies. For instance, in one of the mock-ups, we tried trimming the end grains of the boards, so we didn't have direct moisture wicking up the boards, um, hoping that that would help reduce uh, the moisture available to the fungus growing. Um, but 
if that alone is not, you know, that is not a way to address this, we might also consider finishes being used um, to address the fungal biofilm issues and also weathering of the wood. Of course, this is an iterative process and these policies are still being reconciled with the existing conditions, with what is actually feasible in the environment of the sulk and the owner expectations for the projects. This will evolve throughout the course of the project and the lifetime of the window wall assemblies. So I just want to conclude by thanking all of the contributors to phases one and two of the project. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Kyle. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be back here again with friends and colleagues. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to talk about this project. Um, I would particularly like to thank um, the GCI, Susan McDonald, Sarah, of course, uh, Chandler McCoy, and Sarah Galern for organizing and inviting us to participate in this evening's program. It's been a long journey to arrive at this stage of work under, uh, underway at the Salk Institute, and so with that, I'll get started. Our work actually started in 2014 when the Salk Institute was awarded a grant from the Getty Foundation as part of the Keeping It Modern program. At that time, um, WJE, together with Inskip and Jenkins, was selected to develop a conservation management plan. At the same time, we were also engaged by the Salk Institute to provide technical expertise and review of the work that was currently underway with some of the trial uh, repairs. However, prior to the conservation work at the Salk Institute, WGA, WJE had also worked at the Yale Center for British Art, also designed by Louis Kahn. Um, we were uh, the building's um, conservation consultant, looking at the envelope system and also the structural engineer of record. Uh, we carried out a lot of uh, diagnostic monitoring and testing of the original insulating glass units, which you see here in this photo. Um, we developed a solution to actually control condensation and to reduce ultraviolet light transmission to help um, with the protection of the museum's interior collection. Similar to Sulk, WJE consulted with the museum on their conservation management plan um, regarding technical issues and material conservations for the building. Starting our work in collaboration with the GCI, um, we started with initial trials, which were focused on three different conservation approaches uh, through 2014 and into 2015. As seen in this photo, windows at the studies over the main plaza were of particular focus, given their iconic views overlooking the Pacific Ocean. All of the windows custom fabricated in 1965 in Burmese teak were in more or less their original state, having gone over 50 years of weathering and sustaining different degrees of deterioration. Here you can see an overall plan which shows the office wing area and the study area, other areas. As part of initial window inventory, window types were confirmed, identified, and documented with all the window sizes also recorded. The window inventory confirmed a total of 200 plus windows, 203 to be exact, and all the window wall assemblies were broken down into seven basic frame types and configurations as shown here, with the west facing office wings containing approximately 95 windows and the main study towers facing the plaza containing 108 windows. Our investigation started with the uh, dismantlement of one original window. As Sarah pointed out, there were lots of drawings and photos that depicted the installation of the windows, but we had to confirm how it was actually attached and how components were actually um, uh, connected. So we confirmed that the window walls were indeed um, assembled by craftsmanship in a shop where the teak window wall frames uh, were first constructed. The product was truly a synthesis of industry and fine craftsmanship. Once the fabricated window wall was complete, it was transported to the site and hoisted into place, including separate installation 
of the operable glass and louver sashes. It was critical to understand how these windows were made if we were going to be able to develop uh, the scope for the repair campaign moving forward. So in April of 2015, a full detailed condition assessment was carried out as part of our work to develop the construction documents and to move the project forward into construction. Access was made available via personal lifts and scissor lifts from the main plaza and along the west elevation were uh, carried out, out along the office towers. Numerous conditions were observed during our survey and now I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes kind of taking us through and reviewing some of these typical conditions that we encountered in the detailed survey. The first slide shows that the teak surfaces were worn and definitely in need of remediation. In this photo here, you can see that the horizontal bar was actually detached from the tongue groove, uh, making uh, uh, inroads for water migration in through the skin of, of the window walls. In some um, cases, apparent erosion was also observed due to ultraviolet light degradation. Signs of abrasion, abrasion were evident, perhaps from prior cleaning and refinishing procedures. Deterioration was evident due to weathering exposure from the marine environment over time. As Sarah pointed out, we had uh, tremendous um, challenges with the black fungal stains, which had been an eyesore from the onset of the building uh, and its construction. These ranged from light to thick brown crusts. The stains were studied and found to, ca uh, to be caused by the growth of fungal layer, not deteriorative, but just residing on the surface, forming a thick biofilm layer across the teak um, surfaces themselves. Of course, when we proceeded with the detailed condition assessment, we also um, carried out uh, more detailed investigation of the window wall systems. Um, Sarah referred to uh, openings that were made in approximately uh, half a dozen different locations uh, throughout the building complex. In the detailed condition survey that we moved forward with, it was important to understand the full scope of work and to be able to specify the areas that needed repair. And so we expanded the inspection openings to approximately 36 openings so that we could actually look at the cavity openings in different exposures, multiple window types, and multiple conditions. Of course, at the underlying framing members, we did um, see a lot of deterioration in approximately, um, in, in the 36 openings that we did, we um, uh, had uh, approximately 40% locations where we found termite infestation. We also found dry wood termites, which were identified to be boring through the teak skin itself and making its way into the subframing of the walls. Teak is a very durable material. To have seen this kind of inroads by insects was quite surprising. The existing window frame assemblies um, also did not provide effective wither seals um, that prevented the moisture and air, air from entering into the cavity systems. Here you can see that the um, track locations um, and the slider didn't really have proper seals. These um, these uh, gaskets were added um, over the years to prevent air and water from entering into the building. And of course, as Sarah mentioned, at areas where we had damp conditions, such as the north-facing windows, which you see here in this picture, you could see the accumulation of lots of um, biofilm um, in, in those areas of the upper floors. The isometric diagram that you see here shows a typical assembly for a teak window wall, which we eventually, in the beginning part of our condition assessment, took apart to understand how it was put together. However, looking more closely at this diagram, you can start to see how the structural assembly actually works um, with itself. The diagram depicts a structural assembly of transit panels. You can see also um, the teak components in red, and the subframing components. The same diagram can also show how the load paths work through the window wall system, and this is critical for resisting wind loads and providing stiffening effects uh, for the performance of the window over time. Here you can see that the teak sill spans horizontally, 
uh, between the jams. The right jam shown um, uh, as a built-up teak frame and the left jam, which, show, which includes a wood framing that shares the load pad with the transite panel. Uh, material issues were not just limited to teak elements. We understand here that there were areas of infestation in approximately 40% uh, of, of the openings, which I just described. As seen in this photo, we learned a lot that most of the areas exposed to direct sunlight actually created warm sun habitats for termites within the window pockets themselves. In fact, in the upper photo, you can see here, the furring strips were damaged due to termite infestation and they weakened the uh, cladding on the exterior of the building. In 2015, a row of the uh, tongue and groove paneling blew off the building in a windstorm because the furring strips could no longer hold the tongue and groove elements in place. However, understanding the behavior of the materials was tantamount in developing the repair approaches for each window. This included the transite panels as they relate to bending strength or their flexibility and their attachment to the system. In order to understand how the transite panels themselves were playing a role in the performance of the windows, we carried out research into trade catalogs and looked at the transite panels, which were at the time um, manufactured by Johns Manville. They had created insulating structural panels for both heavy and lightweight construction in the 1960s. Stated as an asbestos-containing material, the panel system was found to be incredibly stable and had uh, withstood the test of time. It had re um, tremendous resistance to decay and termite infestation as well. In fact, in some locations, um, when we had the subframing completely deteriorated, the only thing left um, in its place was the transite assembly, which um, was, was really interesting. As it was known to be in a, co a, a composite assembly, it, it was all, also highly resistant to moisture. As long as the panels were not disturbed, I, um, we, we understood that the material could be encapsulated and could probably remain in place throughout the repair project. So a decision was made to, remain, to retain this material because of its importance and to um, try to work around it as much as possible. Um, in areas where it could not be retained, it was renewed with a new composite subframing assembly. So moving into some of the research that was conducted for wood replacement and the subframing, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the replacement material that we selected, which was the Akoya wood. The uh, Akoya, um, we, we carried out extensive research um, for, for suitable subframing materials for the repair work. Um, we, we had understood from um, uh, internal discussions that Akoya wood had been available since 2007. Um, a literature review and evaluation of the test data for uh, Akoya was also carried out. In short, resistance to decay and termite infestation was well documented um, including exceptional dimensional material stability. This application was advantageous in regards to its application for potential repairs um, and sistering of the pine subframing in the window wall assemblies. For the teak, tongue, and groove cladding and framing members, widespread weathering of the surfaces to a depth of a quarter inch was visible. In some cases, openings in the window sash joinery was also prevalent as seen in the lower right-hand corner. Looking at the wood replacement for the project, it was important to be able to provide um, material characteristics and specifications for the wood replacement. We, we, due to the work that the GCI had performed on identifying the Burmese teak, we then had to um, do extensive research to actually specify the material and how it would be selected for use on the project. So going forward for the development of the construction documents and the construction project itself, we, um, we basically highlighted and underscored the overarching goals for the project, which included the preservation of the overall window assemblies themselves, to preserve the original teak cladding and the sliding windows, louvers and shutters to the greatest extent possible, to try to reduce the general variations in the aesthetic appearance, which I think is something that 
um, we have all seen at the Salk Institute. Um, given the architecture of the building and the different exposures of the elevations, there is tremendous variability in the way that the teak is weathering. We wanted to also try in the project scope to retard the growth of the, black, of the, of the fungal biofilm. Reduction, of course, of the red appearance, uh, which is the later surface coatings that were applied over the years, would also have to be dealt with. And of course, um, the, one of the main objectives was to try to improve the overall performance of the window uh, assemblies themselves against air and water infiltration uh, for suitable uh, uh, office and study environments in the future. The effort to balance the desire of the client, though, for a like new appearance and the performance with the pre preservation concerns was a challenge. Material availability concerns and budget constraints led us to develop varying repair approaches that could be applied on a window by window basis. We didn't take one approach to restoring all of the windows. Instead, what we did is we looked at the conditions and the variability of, its, of each window con condition and applied uh, a repair approach that was suitable for the level of decay in each location. This provided a roadmap that was very difficult for the contractors to get their mind around, <laughs> which I'll go into in a second. I think what you can see here is that um, as we started to uh, lay the roadmap for what would be considered um, the assignment of different repair approaches by the window types, you can start to see here that we had quantities based on the detailed conditions survey that we were able to perform. Um, we then, of course, um, developed the details that would be commensurate with each repair approach. So you can see here why the contractors um, couldn't get their arms around some of the um, repairs for this. This is actually the window inventory that I mentioned at the beginning of our talk here. And this is the schedule that came out of all the repair assignments for all 203 windows. Um, this was developed um, as, a, as a roadmap. And the roadmap also, it didn't just talk about all the repair locations that would be necessar necessary for, for the scope of repairs for the entire project. But it also built in the, uh, the window type schedule, the door schedule. Um, we uh, categorized all the different variable sizes within each window type. And then what's critical here, which was another challenge to get over in the beginning parts of the project, um, was a mock-up schedule. The mock-up schedule um, basically took the different types and the different exposures of the windows, and we developed a, um, a uh, categorization with the Salk Institute to um, start with some what we called the first-in-place mock-ups that would be set as a standard for the construction project. So this was all put into the construction documents and the specifications, which was, was, was quite challenging. So now what I'd like to do is just take you through the three repair approaches that were assigned in that chart that you just saw. And there are basically three repair approaches that range from minor intervention, moderate intervention, and major intervention. And so I'll quickly take you through these as, um, as um, I think we have enough time to do that. So as I said, the repair approach number one was really the most minimally invasive uh, treatment approach, conservation treatment approach for the windows. Based on our survey, we were able to see that a lot of these windows were actually in very good condition. The surfaces were quite intact. Uh, these windows were in protected areas. Oftentimes, they weren't exposed to uh, a lot of uh, UV uh, light or uh, degradation against the ocean. Um, so um, the scope of work for that included refinishing all of the teak frame com uh, components and cladding pretty much in place. Um, it did involve um, the removal of, of the sliding window sashes, the louver sashes where they were present. And also what you see here in the lower floors is the wood panels 
um, which needed to be um, to be stripped of the previous varnish applications, which you see here, sort of as a as a red color. This scope also included, um, as I said, removing a, a removal of the sl uh, sliding window sashes, um, and the refinishing was basically done on site. Here you can see a photo of my colleague, uh, Michelle Sandoval, who is uh, also working on the project. Um, after this process was completed, the reinstallation, um, after, after the treatment was applied, the reinstallation of the sliding sash and panels um, was uh, reinstalled and checked for a smooth operation. I mean, you have to realize too that um, a lot of the operability of the uh, movable sashes had also um, weathered over time. And so it wasn't always so easy to open and close certain situations. So this, this was another challenge that, that we had on the project. Prior to uh, applying a uh, treatment to the teak wood, um, we needed to confirm that the coating treatment was actually performing as the manufacturer had indicated. Uh, this was critical to the specification and so what was done here was um, we had done some, um, um, basically taken a fresh application of the wood treatment, which you see here in this photo, and actually uh, carried out uh, a cross, we prepared some cross sections and looked uh, through some microscopy examination to understand how the accumulation of the coating um, was, was being applied to the surface. So what you see here is you see this thin little layer which the arrow is pointing to is essentially um, five micron thick nano coating, which is the coating that was specified for this project. Um, with the uh, help of some SEM and EDS analysis, we were able to look at the surface of this um, and see that we also had um, a confirmation of some of the mineral components uh, that were present as well as the um, uh, treatment for, uh, for fungal growth. Um, we also had um, lots of mock-up samples to look at the weather stripping, which you see here as part of Repair Approach 1. And then, of course, as Sarah said, we had to actually develop a design detail for the implementation of the metal flashings at the head. And here you can see installation of that. Looking at waterproofing at the base of the concrete and installation, new installation details for the side lights. Repair Approach 2 was a moderate intervention and basically included the entire scope of Repair Approach 1. However, in this situation, what we had was some cases where some of the internal subframing that you see here was actually deteriorated. And so we needed to deal with that by um, repairing the subframing from within selectively and then um, putting in new sheathing, which you see here, uh, followed by the new T and G. In these situations, the tongue and groove, because of its weathered appearance, we had to um, replace the, just the T and G cladding, not, not the frame of the window itself. Here you see the waterproofing going in with the metal flashings, um, before, during, and after. Here you can see a uh, photo of the contractor aligning the tongue and groove with the existing teak uh, refinished frame, a photo looking dead on with the flashing. And finally, Repair Approach 3 was a major intervention, which essentially, if one could summarize this, in, uh, included the entire rebuilding of subframing within the window itself. Um, here you can see the different detailing of this, the removal of, um, uh, in some cases, of the transite assemblies and reinforcing of the teak frame at the jam, and in some cases, putting back a new composite assembly and rebuilding the entire subframing prior to waterproofing. Here you can see a photo um, during the process before and then the localized uh, termite infestation uh, taking all of this out, putting in all new subframing. So I'm going to end the presentation with this um, report, and that is that during the mock-up phase, we had a total window replacement that we carried out as one of our trials. 
And this was important because we wanted to really test the application of whether or not a replicated window would actually work. We found in most, case, in most cases that there was little improvement to the performance of the window. The teak uh, material itself wasn't as high quality as the teak material that we actually had on site that was um, uh, part of the original window construction 50 years ago. The accessibility of the material did not lend itself uh, very, very likely to, to what we were doing for, for this particular case. And I think what's interesting to note is that this is the same window a year later. And you can see with a tremendous amount of sun exposure that the windows fade very quickly. And so with that, I would say that to date on this window project, we haven't had to replace a full window at all. We've managed to conserve all the windows with limited interventions. And I think that that has been the, you know, the result of so much collaboration with all the colleagues and, and, and Salk Institute itself. So construction is scheduled to end in the spring of 2017. Um, and with that, I would just like to acknowledge all of the hard work of our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. As, as Kyle mentioned that the contractors had a hard time getting their heads around this, you can only imagine what it's like from the owner's standpoint. <laughs> I quite often I found myself waking up in the middle of the night feeling like Monster Zinc flying through the window factory instead of the door factory. But, but um, I want to take a few moments to uh, uh, talk a little bit about our CMP, but before I do so, uh, on behalf of the Salk family, um, the Salk Institute, all its stakeholders, uh, and our board of trustees, I wanna uh, extend a, a great deal of gratitude to uh, Getty Foundation for their support, Getty Conservation Institute for their uh, studies and assistance, and also with Jenny, our uh, architectural partner in, in helping bring this project to uh, a reality. As in each of the two presentations you've heard, uh, we want to, uh, first of all, take the interest of our founders and forefathers and put that into practice in everything that we move forward with. So you've heard a, a consistent theme about um, conservation and, and preservation and of, of the, um, in, in all of the significance of the Institute, the importance of all the components that uh, are all involved. So in preserving and conserving uh, efforts that we've done uh, so far, we need to take that forward in the things that we do in the future, and not only ongoing maintenance and repairs, but our business practices as well. Um, so first of all, to do that, we again have to understand the place, and to do that, we want to be able to uh, learn about that, take a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach. And those of you who have been in facilities, management, construction, what have you, we see it all the time. Now from design and construction, it's great with reactive approaches because a lot of money gets spent that way, doing it over and over and over again. But um, uh, I can say that uh, it's been a great uh, honor and pleasure to be at a place that looks forward and backward. Uh, and mostly backward to understand where we started and how we got to where we are so that we can properly move forward. So in doing that, we look at the, you know, understanding the place, uh, moving forward with uh, some of our conservation policies, and we have to take everything into consideration, not just the concrete and the teak, but also the plaza, the, the landscape, the hardscape, the environmental setting around us, our neighbors, and, and we want to look at all those things that went into play in the original construction of the Institute. So we move that forward you know, with the materials and the landscape that, that um, uh, was so thoughtfully uh, played out in the development. So we have to make that a part of our ongoing uh, strategies as we move forward. So again, understanding the place, going back to the archives, going back to the beginning, and um, I can tell you it's, it, it's a great honor to be here tonight because as a young engineer, I was able to be a part of the construction of the Getty here. I was on the original construction team and then being able to wind up in a facilities management position at the SALT and being here at the same time, this is quite a treat. So I, uh, I thank you for that and, and for your participation and interest in what's going on. 
So again, looking at our setting, the design strategies and the thoughtfulness, uh, the assessment of, of the cu cultural significance of how we came to be, how the land grant was provided, how our neighbors in the community of San Diego and La Jolla actually uh, uh, partnered with uh, Jonas Salk and Louis Kahn in establishing the Institute. We also want to develop a statement of significance. You know, how are we culturally uh, you know, situated? Looking at what the vision of Jonas was in terms of the research and looking at the vision of Louis Kahn as to what the, you know, the structure was going to be and how it supported the functions of the Institute and the science that was conducted there. Um, and you know, how we wanted to protect the landscape design and preserve the environment around us. So a lot of the vulnerabilities that, that come along in doing this is we have to um, look at how our expansion impacts our thought process uh, in, as our science grows. You know, how do we uh, change, deal with change around the landscape around us? As you can see, in the, you know, originally there was a lot of open real estate. <laughs> I can tell you right now that has evaporated. There's nothing left. So, um, that makes it even more of a challenge for us as we uh, have to adapt. We also want to look at, you know, our, as I mentioned, the existing facilities, uh, our existing landscape around those facilities, as well as our past growth from the beginning, looking at our East Building complex, our underground facilities have all been uh, constructed since the original construction of the main lab buildings. Again, our environment around us, we have established a conservation easement to the coastal canyon behind us. Um, when we went with the master plan back in 1995 to the Coastal Commission and the city of San Diego, um, they determined this as a need of, a, of an easement not to be built on. So in compliance with that and the desires of our neighbors, we had to adapt to that, but yet we wanted to preserve you know, our, our interest in that as well. The materials, as previously alluded to, um, we, we wanted to come up with concepts of, for the maintenance and preservation of all these materials as we move forward, looking back to the past, learning from some mistakes, and also finding a way to correct some of those. So having said all that, one of the things that inspire me each day when I arrive at the Institute is inscribed in the travertine steps to the courtyard. And sometimes I get uh, a feeling of how dare you, or I'm daring enough and have the confidence to move forward. So it does bring balance to uh, the thought process, but the inspiration is there and it really makes it a, um, a, a real unique opportunity to, to be a part of. So, we also, uh, I wanted to highlight a few things that we've done uh, in terms of uh, recent improvements where we have taken the concepts of the conservation management plan and put them into practice. We, the Institute has been very good at doing that in the years past, but we haven't really had a documented process in, in, in documenting what we do on a daily basis to actually be able to benchmark and measure those achievements and use it as a stepping stone and a basis for moving forward. So that is what we're currently doing. Uh, the plan that we are uh, in development of will be concluded by the end of this month, uh, which will uh, encapsulate the efforts of the past as well as what we're currently doing and a roadmap for the future. So a few years back, we completed um, the uh, renovation of the infrastructure, both mechanical and electrical. Uh, this was a very huge undertaking, but it was actually um, quite rewarding because um, the foresight of Jonas and Lewis of having a building that made it easy to adapt with and change with the redundancy that was built into all this infrastructure gave us the ability to take one side of all the infrastructure down, rebuild that, switch over to the other side and do that. We, it was a 18 month project where we literally took the internal, uh, the total complete internals out and replaced it without interrupting one day of science. And without that vision in the original construction, that would have never been possible. So um, being able to 
do that and be the first one to really do major open heart surgery of the institute and take advantage of those, those uh, basic fundamentals put into play uh, in the original design was, was, uh, was great. Um, so here you see our chillers in our boilers and a part of that we were awarded a, uh, a California Solar Initiative incentive that gave us the opportunity to lay in uh, half a megawatt of solar uh, PV as well. And coincidentally, that 500 kW uh, load of solar power that we're able to generate now offsets the entire central plant electrical load. So we are basically able to provide free cooling to the Institute each day. In addition, you can see the original uh, lab design uh, up in the far left corner that um, was kind of the way our science was at that time, but you can see over the years we have grown in our density. Where and the, originally there was like one PI per floor, now we have up to eight PIs per floor. So the density is really uh, a challenge for us. But we wanted to be able to adapt to that, taking, taking advantage of some modern technologies and, and casework design, but also retain the original uh, layout uh, design that was established in day one. We also want to take care of some unique historical features. The lighting was one of them. If you look at the far uh, top left again, you'll see that that is a, a T12 uh, fluorescent light. And back in the 80s, we went to a T8 fluorescent light. And now today, over in the right, that is all LED. So we went from a 64 watt T12 to now to a six watt LED. We literally took 356 kilowatts of demand out of the Institute doing this. In addition, we integrated a um, wireless mesh network of lighting where we are able to address, give each light fixture a unique address that allows us to program the lighting for any lab conversion that we have. So we now can go in and rearrange a lab without having to re change all the conduit and wire and everything else anymore. That'll never have to be done again. Another one is the exterior lighting of the Institute. This was my first uh, challenge when I arrived at the Institute nine years ago, where one night I was walking through the, the outside of the Institute and I was looking around. The original design was a 250 watt incandescent lamp. And in, during the energy crisis in 1980, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, there was a big incentive program to come out and start changing everything out to compact fluorescence. So all of you, I'm sure, have had their versions of the compact fluorescence with the screw-in type, the three-prong, the four-prong, the curly fry-looking one. And the Institute had a variation of each of those. And as you walk through the Institute at night, you had pink, orange, red, white. <laughs> And um, so I'm going like, is this what really Jonas and Lewis had in mind? You know, so um, working with a partner, uh, we came up with a six watt LED and that's what we have there today. Uh, and so we're able to achieve the same light levels. It's consistent now throughout the Institute, highly efficient and is in concert with the original design concept. So uh, again, uh, going into uh, concrete and antique, uh, we look at the original design, the original construction. This is a 1970s photo here. And as already covered, we went through all the, the teak uh, um, uh, research and mock-ups and design, first in place mock-ups, and we have reached this milestone now. And so today, you can see up in the far left, that is uh, our first in place installations in Tower 13 of one of the study towers, um, matching with the uh, internals of the study and compared to the 1970s. And we think that we have kind of hit that point of nirvana a little bit um, in concert with the original intent and with ways that's gonna preserve it far into the future. Additional challenges, all those who have dealt with poured in place concrete can appreciate. Um, structural movement, uh, thermal expansion, contraction, carbonization of the concrete, 
all led to uh, challenges around the institute. And you can see we have the you know, water intrusion where we have uh, some breaches in some of the areas. But uh, a lot of areas we had rebar that was very, very close to the surface from the original pores. So over time that has uh, found itself to the surface and created spalling throughout the institute. So we took the same approach with the help of WJE um, to first of all understand the existing condition um, and then going back to the original design concepts, we actually were able to pull the archives and find what the original design mix was. We even had the load tickets from the, um, from the uh, trucks that brought the concrete to site and we actually saw what form numbers each of those trucks were poured into. So we were able to reverse engineer this right back to the actual installed elements and be able to simulate that. So in doing so, we made mock-up swatches here uh, so that we could do different mixed designs to deal with the um, time factor of the, con of the concrete as it faded and, and changed colors based on exposures and moisture contributions and wear and tear. So it, give, it gave us a palette of variants of different mixes that we could use based on the exposure of the building. So here's an example where first of all, our first approach was to take the rebar, address it. We cut out a, a, a symmetrical area around it. We pushed the rebar back into the uh, pore away from the uh, surface and then pick our color based upon the exposure and the anticipated weathering, and then go to work. One of the unique things about the Institute is the reveals that Lewis Kahn put into the, the, the pores. So we wanna make sure that we match that, and we had a conversation earlier um, with uh, Jonathan and, and saw that his interest was, I remember looking at the original pores of the walls that went into the Institute. I said, yes, that wall is still there. It's in the lower level of our central plant and we actually built our switch gear away from that wall so we could preserve those sample pores that were made. And uh, Louis Kahn had his writing in one of the form sets that actually showed what he really wanted. And we have a, a protective layer over that protect his handwriting so that it is now a historical monument within our central plant. So again, that conservation process and preserving the heritage and where we came from so that we can understand where we are and where we're going. Again, here's a couple other examples. We uh, also uh, set the forms. We come up with bird nose pour. Uh, we pull that off and you see the reveal has been retained. We have a good surface coverage and we have uh, some uh, aggregate uh, mixture so we can replicate the dimpling of the pour. And then uh, over time, this will fade into what we feel will match around the area. So that's just a quick once through on what we're currently doing as we move forward. And really our key to success in the future after some of these major capital renewal uh, efforts are completed is to one, complete our conservation plan so that we can put it in to our business processes, our deferred maintenance uh, planning, our preventive maintenance routine uh, efforts, as well as our budgeting and, and uh, forward plan fiscal planning. And also is a desire of ours to establish uh, architectural preservation endowment that will allow us as a nonprofit to establish some designated funds that will go toward the ongoing preservation of our uh, architectural significance. And um, we feel that's important because uh, while our research is very important, we also feel that the, the structure is important. Um, and there's a lot of people that have uh, you know, interest in each of those separately as well together. So with that being said, we feel that the efforts that have been put forward uh, uh, so far and the support that we have received, um, more, most especially of, of late with the uh, Getty Conservation Institute and the foundation, uh, we feel that we're well positioned to create an environment for the future that uh, will allow our, our structure to be uh, still uh, a major contributor to the function of the laboratory and the science 
that will ultimately result in uh, an improvement in humanity and a quality of life for us all. And so thank you. So do we have uh, any questions? Okay, well, perhaps I do get to ask mine first. Um, I, I had a question um, uh, for Tim um, to start with. Is you know, as the person who is largely responsible for the for the stewardship of this building, um, what do you think some of the most valuable lessons of this conservation approach that um, has been uh, you know introduced over the last few years might be for the institute and um, and if you were talking to asset managers from other properties, um, what would you tell them that was helpful about it? Well, I think it, it helped bring true to, um, you know, one of the things you look at as a property owner, you know, are you gonna build, own, and maintain? Are you gonna build, own, and move on and resell or whatever? So. Uh, as an institution, much like uh, institutions of higher learning and what have you, we're there for the long haul. We're going to build, own, and operate for a long period of time. And given the culture and community of of, of Salk, what it means, it's it's it, you know it's histor historical significance and whatnot. You have to rethink the way that that you approach things. And having a well thought out plan in you know for the preservation and conservancy. Um, that, that, that's crucial uh, because it drives all of your business thinking and the decision process that you have to do in, in maintaining and operating as well as the master planning. Um, an example would be the central plant when we did that, it was one opportunity to take advantage of new technologies, put it in the same footprint, make it function the way it was originally intended to work, uh, only with some improvements and efficiency as well as added capacity for future growth. So what we did is we built all that capacity into the plant so that when and if we ever grow and add uh, additional square footage, we have the capacity to support that. So we only make the investment once rather than multiple times. So Teak, same way, um, it, when we first started that, I was looking at going like, oh, how are we going to pull this off? Because, you know, at a cursory look, we're going to have to replace it all. But as you took the the approach that we did, we learned more and were able to find out that, um, you know, preservation is the best way to go for a lot of reasons. And as Kyle alluded to, we are retaining a 70% retention rate of the original teak, which is phenomenal. I never dreamt that we would do that well with it. So um, not only are we able to recover that, but we're able to extend its life probably at least another 50 to 70 years, hopefully. Um, uh, because the wood, after you got through the surface of it, was still very good. So, um, uh, yes, that took an investment, but when you look at that over time, um, and again, the foresight that Louis Kahn had, you know, while he, his intentions was a maintenance-free facility, he really did almost achieve that. Um, and uh, the only thing that we've had to deal with is the, the natural elements. And, so being able to take that into consideration, new technologies, extending the performance and the life of it um, is a better investment over the long run. Okay, did uh, anyone, ah, Jeffrey, there's a microphone coming your way. Uh, good evening, Jeffrey Her uh, Department of Cultural Affairs for the City of Los Angeles. Um, I believe it was Kyle who was going through um, a few of the challenges uh, that were presented with this particular project, and one of them had to do with meeting client expectations as regards to uh, the finished look. Um, and I was wondering if uh, one of you might want to expand a little bit on how you arrived at uh, a compromise. Well, I think we could all go into a really long discussion on this. I think um, my, my presentation gave really an overview of what, um, how the decision was made, which was that um, I think what you saw in both Sarah's presentation and, and Tim's presentation is that we had, um, um, the GCI had really set up some test panels up on the roof to really monitor um, different treatments over time. 
and we had such a, a, an array of, of selections, but I think there, were, there was an impetus to follow the philosophy um, from early on, which came from Jonas Salk, that they were um, quite enamored with the original teak appearance, the, the sort of the natural wood color. And so <clears throat> there were some treatments that you saw on the test panels, which actually were variations on a theme with regards to that natural appearance. Now, there is also the philosophy, and I think Sarah could speak uh, better to this than I can, about the, you know, the philosophy that uh, Louis Kahn had, which was to have a maintenance-free uh, teak wood that would weather uh, quite naturally over time. And if you saw some of the photos uh, that were presented, there was a, a kind of a, a, a sort of whitening or gray appearance to that. The, the, the problem that we have um, at, the, at the Salk Institute, and it's, not, it's, it's really a perception problem, which is that the black biofilm deposits have always kind of gotten in the way of, of a, a sort of more natural weathering of the wood because they provide a very um, unsightly appearance to the windows. So how did we come to a decision on, on the first treatment? Well, the first treatment, as I showed in the slide, um, was, was actually a very, a very thin coating, which is really meant to slow down the UV degradation of the wood while providing some protection to the, um, the, the, the black biofilm deposition. So what we're trying to do is even out the weathering process for both the old teak that was remaining in the windows and the new teak that was introduced. And so what we're planning to do is, now that we have an even palette, a palette or playing field, if you will, with the, the windows that are being um, conserved, that over time we'll be able to monitor the different, um, the, the different weathering uh, parts uh, of, of the complex and try to understand which areas need more attention and care over time and which areas will simply uh, weather uh, quite um, uh, uniformly, if you will. So um, the, the selection was made at this time to apply a very th uh, light treatment of, of the uh, pigmented um, uh, natural teak color um, of treatment, which is, which is more of a protective uh, agent against the UV degradation of the wood. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, a contributing factor that was an environmental and, and cultural aspect where a lot of that black biofilm is actually a, uh, you know, being expended from the eucalyptus trees around. So uh, we had a choice of either coming up with a, a good approach to mitigating that or cutting down the trees. So of course, we're not going to cut down any eucalyptus trees just like we don't want to cut down any teak. So um, uh, in that the eucalyptus is, is a component of, of, of the Institute's environment. So uh, we had to find a way so that they could coexist. Right, and I think, I mean, one of the big challenges um, that we summed up was this kind of balancing material integrity concerns and aesthetic or visual integrity concerns. And, you know, while we really, at least at the GCI, we initially really wanted to embrace this, can we just let it go gray? And can we do something to mitigate this, you know, this fungal biofilm by design modifications? And that alone was not working and so we we said you know it's these extreme it's these extreme differences that are really detracting to the aesthetic significance of the site and so can we come to some this some middle ground that better integrates it but understanding that you know it's still going to continue to weather differentially by exposure but at least if we can kind of get it back to moderate differences in appearance and i you know one of the other issues we had to consider was we had a lot of new teak, we were going to have a lot of new teak adjacent to existing weathered teak, and they for quite some time have quite a different appearance themselves. So while I think we were initially very reticent about one of these, pigment, these pigmented finishes, they did actually in the beginning help to sort of integrate those two materials rather than having this really patchwork effect across the plaza. I think um, the question, Jeffrey, too, goes to one of uh, a challenge that has been faced by many people dealing with the conservation of modern architecture, and that is um, an expectation for modern buildings that might be different from how we might treat more traditional buildings, where they're expected to acquire a patina, they're expected to age, that's graceful, it's part of what we try and conserve. But for modern buildings, particularly in the first 
decades or so of their conservation, there was an expectation that they would look pristine and they would look new. Um, but keeping buildings pristine and new uh, is very difficult um, uh, for more than a short space of time and without quite a lot of quite a lot of money. And particularly when you had a building like this one, where the architect had wanted the building to weather. So that balancing between um, aesthetic significance and integrity and uh, uh, sort of architectural integrity across the building with the inevitable and 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 it's impossible to prevent. Um, deterioration and aging that does occur across different facets of the building has been something that I think has really come to the fore in this particular project, but is common to so many modern buildings that um, we're dealing with. We've probably got time for one more question, if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Edward Levin, architect. Uh, in terms of the thin film that you've applied over the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the existing and the, and the renewed teak, what's your expectation for the performance of that? Uh, how, how long do you think that uh, that lifetime will be before it needs to be renewed? And what's your, what sort of monitoring program do you have in place uh, for determining when to when to renew that and how? So I think just building what Susan just said and what we were all just talking about was that given the architecture of the site and the, the building constructions that we have, so many varied um, conditions with regards to weathering. So we have uh, locations that face the ocean. We have south-facing locations, which we feel are most vulnerable to UV degradation. And then all the north-facing elevations, which don't receive much sun and protected areas. So um, at this time, we're anticipating that we'll probably have to monitor the south-facing elevations probably more than the other elevations. And um, once we complete the project in the spring, the monitoring process, the clock will start ticking and we'll start to um, be more aggressive about the monitoring and coming up with treatment recommendations, whether it be cleaning the biofilm on a regular basis or uh, reapplication or uh, potentially, you know, taking a different direction if, if the treatments themselves are evaluated uh, and don't perform according to expectations. Yeah. Well, we have to support that is we have actually an integrated uh, uh, asset management system where we actually program in all these components, both you know for all the uh, attributes of the institute. And like Kyle uh, stated, that we have multiple exposures and multiple monitoring points that we're doing. Now we have a good uh, idea based on the indicative uh, weathering patterns that we've incurred on our samples already that are going on almost two years old now. Um, yeah, so we, we have a pretty good indication of a worst case scenario uh, that we're able to build from. We, we're using that as a baseline and then we'll make adjustments. You, you saw that window matrix. That's actually being loaded into our management system so we can take that um, um, pattern and apply it to each of that matrix so that then we can program that into the system and automatically you know, give us a work ticket, you know, at different intervals based on that pattern with a list of mitigation uh, approaches to do that. And then on the financial model side of that, what we've done is we've used that to forecast forward, you know, what the cost requirements are going to be to support that. And so that we can use that for our budgeting processes as we move forward to ensure that it gets done. So, and I think it's true to say that the life cycle of the treatments was very much a part of the determining of the approach to um, working out you know, what, what sort of pro treatments would be appropriate. Okay, so I apologise. We have gone slightly over time. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our, um, our speakers tonight, Tim Ball, Sarah Ladenwire and Carl Normanden. And um, thank you very much for being with us. And we'd like to invite you to join us for a drink in the foyer uh, where you can ask more questions to any of these three. And um, just to give you a bit of advanced warning that we're planning our next talk probably around February or March, and it's going to be looking at the conservation of Watts Towers uh, here in Los Angeles. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you.